Okay, welcome to the final lecture of this series. Um, and this lecture will not be on the blackboard there. I want it to be a little more light since I think everybody is exhausted and, and looking forward to the dinner, those of you who are coming. Um, and so what I want to talk to, to you this afternoon about is um, another application of the techniques that we've developed in this course to a problem in discrete mathematics and in particular in, in combinatorics or, or graph theory. So <clears throat> as you all know, uh, we now live in a world where connections, social networks, the internet, uh, meta, and these are modeled by graphs. Networks are graphs, and here is a picture from 2003 of the internet. Okay, so the, the thing you realize here is, of course, that these are huge graphs, and things you would like to understand is how well connected are they. You want to find measures that in simple terms characterize if a network is highly connected or not. And so you will f you're looking for simple quantities, a number that describes the connectivity. Um, so here is the mathematical structure of a graph. Uh, it consists of vertices. These are the dots and edges between them. And you can also put a metric on the edges by assigning a length or a weight to it. And one of the numbers that describes the connectivity of a network is its diameter. And the diameter is the maximal distance between any two vertices that you can find. And distance defined to, with respect to whatever metric on the edges you choose. And these days you can just go to your favorite program here, Mathematica, and all these things are built in. Um, so it's really easy to play around with this. So I've just um, generated a random graph here the so -called, from the so-called watts strogatz model. And uh, you see the red um, line is uh, a curve that connects these two vertices. It is the shortest such curve. And it realizes um, the diameter of this graph. And it's well known and has been observed and known for a long time that uh, the networks you see uh, in the real world um, satisfy an interesting scaling law, namely that the number, uh, the, that the diameter grows very slowly in the number of vertices. So typically, like the logarithm of, this, of the number of vertices. And um, so, you know, the diameter is obviously only one of the, the uh, kind of quantifiers that you can, can choose for, for connectivity, but it's the one that we want to study in this, um, in this talk. And you see here just a numerical realization of uh, the watts strogatz model that I had in Mathematica. So for each n, I'm generating a random, exactly one random um, graph. And you see that's the log n function, and it looks pretty good. Of course, there are fluctuations around it. There's no question. Now, the watts strogatz model is a very, very simple model that doesn't capture all the effects, but it's become extremely popular. So these kind of papers have, I don't know, ten of, tens of thousands of citations. And the model is very simple. So you just start with this circular graph. You have n vertices, and you connect here the nearest neighbor and the next to nearest neighbor. And then you create a so-called small world model. So small world means that you have extremely high connectivity. So you, maybe you've heard of this law that everybody on the planet is connected with, uh, with, with anybody else by at most six neighbors or something like that, six other people. So this, this would mean that the, the world has a diameter of six, right? 
something along those lines. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's sort of the, the catchphrases you see. And so such this watt strogatz model was one of the first to, to try to model this behavior, this logarithmic growth of the diameter. And so what you do is with probability p, you remove a connection and you reassign it randomly uh, with equal probability to one of the other um, nodes in your network. And so as the probability uh, goes from zero to one, you see um, these networks, these, uh, these uh, whole family of networks. And the op numerical observation of Watson and Strogatz was that already for quite small values of p, of the removal uh, probability, you see a logarithmic growth in the diameter. Now there are rigorous results, beautiful papers. Um, in fact, this one here uh, um, is very closely related to the um, watts strogatz model. It's also, you start with an end cycle and then you add random matching, so it's almost the same thing. But of course, it was written by some pure mathematicians and so probably it only has 100 citations or something like that instead of tens of thousands. And they actually proved something. So they proved that the diameter is bounded above, below by uh, log n up to a small log log n correction factor. There's also a nice paper by Bolobash and Riordan. So you see um, there's a big industry here uh, of these papers. I, I, um, you, you can't really see it, maybe from the back. There are many other papers here which I put in gray because I only wanted to mention these two. Um, uh, but, so there is a whole whole industry of, of people working on this, and it's a, it's a beautiful problem in combinatorial probability. Okay. Now, what we want to look at is um, not none of these uh, um, sort of random uh, small world network models, but a different family of random graphs that are very, very regular. And we want to understand how big the diameter is and, and for those guys. And these are the so-called circulant graphs. Circulant graphs ha appear in particular um, in computer science where people want to construct highly symmetric um, networks that, for instance, are used in parallel uh, computing um, and that have a certain redundancy. So you want still good connections, but you also want to have um, uh, sort of a very symmetric structure. Okay, and so this is how they define. So you uh, want to construct a graph with n vertices, and so you, um, you pick uh, numbers a1 up to ak that tell you how to connect the vertices. And let me just go through one example um, to make it very clear what's going on here. So let me construct a circulant graph with n equal to 8 vertices. So let me draw the vertices here. And now I'm going to connect them. So let me choose, let me choose two connectors. A1 will be 2, and A3 will be, uh, sorry, A2 will be 3. Um, some nice colors. So these I'm going to do in orange, and this one in blue. So, okay. And let me actually label my guys. So uh, let's start here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six, seven, eight. Okay, and now you see the, the, the way to co connect them, the rule to connect them is you connect two vertices if their difference is uh, congruent to two modulo eight. We want to assume that these three numbers uh, here in this case have GCD1 because you can convince yourself otherwise you would get a disconnected graph and we don't want that, right? Because then we can always just throw one away. So it's a natural assumption that the GCD is one. Okay, so what we're going to do? Well, one is connected to three, connected to five, connected to seven, connected to one. And 
Similarly, okay, two is connected to four, four connected to six, six connected to eight, and eight connected to two. Um, right, so now we've done these guys. You see that gives us two graphs, disconnected ones, but now we also have to connect um, um, with A2. So one is connected to four, four is connected to seven, seven is connected to, so seven plus three is 10, is two modulo eight, right? So we go to eight and then we go on um, five, eight, Eight plus three is eleven. Is three modulo eight? Uh, six. Yeah, thank you. And one. Oh, good. Yeah, thank you very much. So this is our circulant graph. Yeah. Does everybody get the idea? Okay. So good. And now we want to know what is the diameter of such a graph. And here is an example uh, when n is large. And we are interested in the case when n is large. And when we throw these numbers, A1, A2, et cetera, at random. OK, and um, here is the result. OK, so we'll, we'll now pick those numbers, A1, for some given k and n to be random. And how do we do this? Well. We have a choice here. We can take a, some set D. This could be a ball. And then we enlarge it. So we've done this already very often, right? You take a set D, you enlarge it, and you take all the points in that set. And as I said, we want that the GCD of the coefficients of A and N, that that is 1, because otherwise we get disconnected graphs. And um, then we construct the circulant graph, which is Cn L of A. So I glanced over L. L are the lengths. So I can assign a length function here. For all the blue edges, I want the length to be the same. And also for the red edges, I want the length to be the same. For now, just take them to be 1. The reason why I bother you with you know, having lengths that are not necessarily 1 will become clearer uh, later in the talk. OK. Um, very good. So this theorem now says that if you look at a random circulant graph where the a's and the n is random, and you look at its diameter, if you normalize it in exactly this way, then this random variable here has a limit distribution. And I'm going to show you in a minute how this limit distribution looks like. So what you see already here is that the diameter is not scaled by log n, but by n to the 1 over k. So we don't see this effect of the small world network. But we, so when k is large, you know, it's, it's, it's growing slower and slower, so the more connectors you, you, you put. But that's the scaling. And here is a picture of this limit distribution in the case when we have two, two of those connectors. k is equal to 2. And there is an explicit formula for this, which is, again, some formula that we've never seen before. Uh, uh. OK. And now what is the limit distribution? It is given by the covering radius of a random lattice in RK with respect to this polytope. So I have to tell you what is the covering radius. You already know what a random lattice is, but I'll remind you. So that's the answer. And there you see, of course, ah, random lattices come back. And that's why I'm talking about this, right? Because what we've done so far all the time is we said we start with some problem, directions, and things like that. And then the limiting distribution, remember uh, this morning we talked about quasi-crystals and yesterday evening. We looked at um, uh, when you, you know, rotate a, a, a quasi-crystal, you ask what's the probability of finding k points in a randomly rotated stretch set. That has a limiting distribution, which is given by a random lattice. And so that appears here again. So 
what is a covering radius? So you take a lattice. So let me start with a lattice. Here's a two-dimensional lattice. And that's one thing that's given, L. And the other thing is K. So it's some set K. Let me think of the set K being something like this. The disk, let's say, right? And then you, you um, <clears throat> what you do is around each lattice point, you draw your set K. So this is a very bad picture because obviously this should be a periodic picture. And the covering radius is now the factor R by which you need to expand or, or shrink your set K so that the expanded or shrunk copy of K translated by L covers all of R V. Now, if you make R large enough, then it, of course, will always happen. So the covering radius is the smallest R, the infimum over all those R, so that you just cover all of R2 in this case, and generally Rd. That's the covering radius. So it's a function of the set that you're using and the lattice. And uh, what is a random lattice? Well, you're all experts in what a random lattice is, right? It's a random point in your space of lattices with respect to Haar measure. And um, so the, the interesting observation is that in this limit theorem, let me go back to the limit theorem. This limit distribution here, you see, only depends on the choice that we have here, the polytope, which is a fixed thing. So in dimension two, in k equals two, it would just be a square. And in k equals three, it would be an octahedron. Um, and it doesn't depend at all on the choice of d. And that's something, you remember, that we have seen also before. When we were averaging over our spheres, and we were averaging over the sphere with respect to some measure lambda, the lambda didn't feature in the limits. And that's, this is exactly the same observation here. And of course, the way we're going to prove this conjecture is exactly in the same way as we did before. Now, um, also the length, the, the, the limit distribution will be independent of the length. That's also a funny thing, right? So there's, real, there's some sort of some universality here. Note that we normalize by the, by the product of the length. So the only dependence is in this normalization. And this uh, settles a conjecture of um, some graph theorist who wanted to understand whether indeed random circular graphs have a limit distribution. The diameters of random circular graphs have a limit distribution. Now. How are we going to deal with this problem? Exactly in the same way as we dealt with all our problems, we have to translate the question into a question of equidistribution on the space of lattices, right? And then pick the right test functions and integrate over the right thing. And this will be done in three steps. So first, we will show that the circulant graphs can be identified with such lattice graphs. So think of this as the analog of the plane, or RD, that we always looked, right? And then we looked at a sublattice, and RD modulo that, not a sublattice, a, a lattice in RD. And if we looked at RD modulo lattice, then we get a torus. And here we will do the same thing. We will take this lattice graph, where you have Z2, and then you connect all the nearest neighbor uh, uh, vertices in this way by edges. And then you look at a subgroup of C2, which will identify points. And then you'll get a finite discrete torus in this way. Then we'll approximate the discrete tori with continuous tori. And then we show, as before, that the tori coming from circular graphs are actually uniformly distributed in the space of all tori 
which is nothing but, as you've heard in Anton Zorich lectures, the same thing as the space of all lattices. OK, so let's do it. So first of all, uh, let's start with um, the lattice graph. That's just the vertices are at the integer lattice points, and we are going to define a metric on there. And that's exactly done by simply, it's much simpler than it looks like in the formulas. So uh, let me actually make the picture over there using already the right colors. So So here's my lattice graph. And I just define a metric by saying the vertical distance between two points is, say, L2, and the horizontal distance is L1. Yeah, And that defines a metric on this object. So that's the first, first line. And this lattice graph will then be denoted by LK. Um, OK, and then we can um, sort of lift this lattice graph up to define some SLK plus 1 action. Um, and then you can forget about all of that I've written there. I don't want to bother you with that. Um, the, the main observation is this first lemma and that is that we can, if we take uh, the lattice graph and we mod out by the correct discrete subgroup, not the discrete subgroup, I'm sorry, with a correct sublattice of Zk, and this was what all this was about, is just to give you a formula, basically, for which sublattice in Zk to choose that gives you the right identification, okay? You just trust me that this works, and I'm going to illustrate um, this, in this particular example how to get from the circulant graph to this uh, uh, finite torus. Is everybody with me? Right? You get a torus, a standard continuous torus, by starting with a lattice and then identify opposite sides. And how do you do this? Well, the, the lattice points give you that, uh, that identification. So now I want to do exactly the same thing here. I want to find vectors that identify points on this discrete lattice graph, and that will give me then a finite graph with finitely many vertices. And what I'm saying is that that uh, graph will be isomorphic to the circulant graph that we're interested in. And it's a little surprising that that wasn't used more in the circulant graph literature to us. We found one paper where that surprise was expressed, and that paper was just a few years old. OK. But I might be wrong. I mean, uh, there's a huge literature there, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that this correspondence has been used, used before. But for us, it's the key. OK, so let me just illustrate this here, how this works in this particular example. So. Um, so I want to um, start, yeah, let's start with vertex, vertex one, 1 here. So let's suppose this is vertex 1. And then, oh, let's say this one here. Let's suppose this is vertex 1. And now I'm just simply going, uh, let's say, this way. So I'm going to vertex 3. So then this would be vertex 3, right? This would be vertex 5. And then where do I go next? Vertex 5. No, have I done this correctly? Sorry, I'm going from, I'm doing the orange one. So I'm going from 1 to 3, 3 to 5, 5 to 7, and then I'm, I'm back to 1. OK, I need another line up here. And then I'm back at 1. So what does it mean? It means that this point and that point have to be identified, right? So I'm going to just draw that 
line that identifies those two points with a different color, green. So this guy and this guy are identified, and then you see the periodicity coming up here. So this one should be vertex seven, and so on. Okay? So that's, if you like, one of the, the vectors that would give me um, uh, um, the identification of the torus. Now, let's continue. So uh, let's do the blue guy. So one is connected to, uh, let's go the same way. One to four, seven. One goes to four, then I have seven. And um, what else have I got here? Three goes to, three goes to, six. I have to be careful I go the right way. Now let me do the whole thing here. Four, seven, two, okay. And, ah, and then I should do that one as well here. So four goes, the, the orange guys now, four goes to six, right? Four goes to six along the orange line and then this will be eight, yes? What will this be? Huh? What? Two, very good. Why? Because, yeah, we're taking things modulo eight. 10 modulo eight is two. What would we have here? Two, right? Ah, so it works, actually. You look, this identification also works here. This one is identified with this one. Perfect. Okay, now what have we got here? We go along the blue line. Three, six, and then? Three, six, one. Three, six, one. Okay. Now we see one and one is identified. So again, I, I use a blue line. So these guys are identified. And, oh, damn it. Okay, so this should go... This should be the same vector as here, so there is an image of one here, right? So what you see here is that, uh, what comes up here? What comes up here? Can that someone tell me? Hmm? Four, exactly, yeah, four. Four, okay, and now what do you see? I have a fundamental domain here of my discrete torus, right? This is sort of the fundamental domain of my discrete torus. No numbers repeat, they're exactly eight numbers. So these eight vertices are the fundamental domain and, uh, and that fundamental domain tessellates everything, okay? So I've showed you here that this graph is isomorphic and isometric to this graph because these lengths are exactly chosen. Um, they're all the same, the orange guys. The blue guys might be to have different lengths but I've done it in a way that it does and this works this works, right, in, in full generality. And the, the proof is, either, is, is, is completely algebraic of that fact. Okay, so you believe lemma one. And so what we're gonna do then is, remember, we are really interested here in the limit of um, large n. So, when n is very, very large, what you can show here is that the diameter of such a finite discrete torus, now there are many, many, uh, a fundamental domain, fundamental cell will now contain many. So here's a general fundamental cell of a discrete torus. So there are now many, many points in here. Uh, and we are interested in the diameter, right? So the diameter will be the distance, the largest distance that you can get between any two points. Let's say here. And the metric is sort of going along the edges. Now, let us rescale the length. Um, 
so that we scale everything to have length one. So we just have to multiply this picture by a diagonal matrix which has the L's in the diagonal and that'll do it for us. And then we compare the distances that we get in the limit when n is very large with um, the continuous torus with R2. And you see when you just um, look at the diameter of a continuous torus, the diameter cannot be much different from the one on the discrete torus because you're just moving by something of the order one over n in each direction, right? And n is large, so you're making a small mistake only. That's this lemma too, okay? And then the third observation is, if you now look at the diameter of a continuous torus, that's the torus we, we've been seeing today in, in Anton Zorich's lecture, uh, RK modulo a lattice, that you can show is nothing but the covering radius that appeared before with respect to this particular polytope, the symmetric polytope. You just believe me, right? And you can prove it for yourself if you like. So actually the, the more natural geometric information is not this polytope, but it's simply the diameter that appears here of a random lattice. So I could have formulated that in the theorem. The reason why I'm using this is because that's also a very natural fundamental object in, in the geometry of numbers. And so both of them are equally, equally natural. And then, so th that was step two. So we have translated the problem of the diameter on the circulant graph into a problem of a diameter of a continuous torus. We said that's approximately the same thing. And now, all we need to show uh, is that the diameter of the continuous torus that corresponds to this kind of random lattice that we are picking, so the random lattices that come from circulant graphs are not all random lattices. They are very, very special. In particular, they are the, the, the vectors that you have here, they are all rational. These are all rational lattices. And so the thing that you now need to show is that when you sum over all the rational lattices, so this is now the analog equidistribution theorem that we considered before where we were rotating our lattices and then stretching them and we were integrating over this rotation, right? You remember, we had an integral over V, over the direction in which our lattice was going. We were integrating that and we would say that would become equidistributed. Now we don't have an integral over rotations anymore, but we rather have a different uh, averaging here over all those lattices L that come from those specific circulant graphs. And what one can show is that this average over those lattices again becomes equidistributed in the space of lattices. Okay, so now we are in the position of again applying our trick as before of realizing, choosing a particular function f here that will give the covering radius of the particular lattice that corresponds to this circulant graph. We plug that in here. We again remember that we can choose characteristic functions. They're not just continuous, uh, bounded continuous functions by um, the argument involving the Siegel Beach formula, or here in this case, just the Siegel formula. Okay, so, and then we, go, we do what we've done before and we get our limit theorem. Okay? So that's, the, that's the, basically the main message. Get your equidistribution result, use it to prove um, the, 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 the theorem on the, on, the, on the randomness of the diameters that, that you wanted. Now this equidistribution result has been improved by Han Li in a very beautiful paper. And I should say, the way I've proved this result is just using the equidistribution of unipotent translates um, that, you, that we had in the lecture. So there is a very nice approximation argument which is similar to this Margulis trick of thickening things 
that, um, that you can use. So I'm, I was, I'm, I've simply thickened the neighborhoods of these little lattices by a tiny amount and then showed that you can then, once you've thickened it, you can relate it to a continuous integral and reduce it to the, que to the questions that we studied earlier in the course. And this theorem has been recently um, improved. So remember, note here that I'm summing over both A and N. And there is a, a fantastic improvement by Einsiedler, Moses, Shah, and Shapira, who simply uh, don't have to uh, uh, sum over N, but keep N fixed. So in other words, what this means in this scenario here is that I had to also throw the number of vertices at random while they um, don't. And they use very, very heavy agotic theoretic techniques um, that built on, on Ratner's theorem. OK. And now let me come to the other problem in the talk and show you how this connects to the previous question. And I should say, as I've indicated, what was before, that was all joint work with, with, with Andreas Strömbergson. So now we are looking at uh, also a beautiful problem in discrete mathematics that um, started over 100 years ago, um, or even more than that, on so-called Frobenius numbers. So you start with uh, selecting um, a primitive lattice vector. You all know what, what, what this is, so a primitive lattice point. And then you ask, which linear combinations can I form here um, with coefficients that are non-negative <clears throat> integers? And what you can show is that from some number onwards, for every fixed A, you can represent every integer in this way. And Frobenius asks, what is the largest integer that cannot be written in this way? Okay. And so, so, so this is just the formula for it. So what's the largest integer that doesn't have a representation of this type? This is called the Frobenius problem. It's also called the coin exchange problem or postage stamp problem. Why is it called a coin exchange problem? Well, um, you think of the A's that you have here as the denomination of the coins that you have in one currency. So two, two cents, three cents, five cents. And then you have another currency, uh, and you want to represent, you want to ask, you know, uh, or, or let's put it this way, you go into a shop and you want to understand what, price, what things can I buy, what values can I buy that, uh, with, with those coins, right? And you don't get change, that's because it's not negative linear combination, so there's no change, right? It's a little bit like going into the cafeteria here. Uh, OK. And this is a very old problem. Uh, Sylvester asked, what's the formula uh, if you just have two coins? OK, and here's the formula. A1, A2 minus A1, A2. And there are no such formulas, believe it or not, if, if you have more. It's already extremely difficult for three, and people have developed sort of continued fraction-style approaches. Um, and there's a beautiful paper by Brauer and Shockley. So this all goes back to, uh, to Frobenius. And then Frobenius had a student, Schur, who basically um, uh, understood something and told Brauer and Shockley about it, and then oh, told Brauer about it. So this is, uh, I think, Alfred Brauer. There's, there were two brothers, Richard Brauer and Alfred Brauer. I think Richard Brauer was the more famous. Um, uh, in, in, in representation theory, I think. And anyway, there's a beautiful paper here that goes back to Schur uh, on this problem. And I'll, I'll show you in a second what this is about. And then there was lots of work. I got inspired uh, to work on this by um, a paper by Arnold, who called this arithmetic turbulence. So what Arnold's uh, question was is, OK, we don't get a formula for f of a, right? But when you do numerical experiments and you put the A's in, you see that it fluctuates wildly. So it's really a random, it looks like a random function of A. And so he said, well, can we describe those fluctuations in some natural way? And, um, 
uh, Sina and Bourguin then worked on it and, and characterized those fluctuations. They were up and lower bound. So this is a, a very popular program in a whole community um, called, non, uh, called linear integer programming. Because you can, certain optimization problems can be uh, phrased in uh, terms of integer linear combinations uh, that have to satisfy certain, certain bounds and have to have certain solutions. Okay, so uh, what, what I proved here is that you can show that indeed the Frobenius numbers have a limiting distribution. Okay, so you take A random, just as before, you take any nice domain D, you make it large, and then you pick, pick the A's in that big domain uh, random with uniform probability, and you get a limit distribution. And the limit distribution, as you will not be surprised, is given again by the probability that a covering radius of a random lattice uh, uh, yeah, so that's the, the limiting distribution is given by the covering radius of a random lattice with respect to this thing. So it's no longer this regular polytope, but it's now this simplex here. Um, and as I said, um, in dimension three, Sina, Bourguin and Sinai, and uh, also Shur, Sinai, and Ustinov proved a version of this. And then everybody said, well, but we don't have higher dimensional continued fractions. And that's when you should say, ah, but we have the space of lattices in higher dimensions, which is so much more easy to control, right? And that's how you can solve these problems. Anyway, so here are some, some uh, uh, images of the limiting density that Andreas Strömbergson produced um, from the limiting distribution. So these are, we don't have uh, exact formulas here. Um, uh, and so the only thing we can do is we can take this random variable and um, devise uh, and, and put it on the computer and, and make these drawings. Uh, only in d equal to three, there is an explicit formula. In higher dimensions, uh, Andreas Strömbergson proved um, tail asymptotics for these distributions. So that's very interesting because they don't decay exponentially, they have a heavy tail. Very good. And so now let me just say in one word, I don't want to go through this whole slide, I just want to say in one word, why do I talk about these two things in the same talk? Well, A, you've seen that the, um, the, the two limit theorems look sort of very similar, except that in both cases you get the limit distribution of, a cov of, of um, the covering radius of a random lattice, just that the covering radius is taken with respect to two different sets. In one case here, in the Frobenius number, it's a simplex. In the other case, it's uh, another regular polytope. Okay, and, and the reason is it can be explained in a, in, a, in, a, in a nice way following this original idea of Brouwer and Shockley that, as I said, goes back to Schur. And so the idea is to first reduce everything modulo one of the coefficients that you're looking at here, right? So remember, we're looking at this primitive lattice vector A that has coefficients A1, A2, up to AD. And so you reduce it mod 1, and you show that the <clears throat> Frobenius number can be written as the, maximo, the maximum over these FRA, which you can think of as <coughs> the largest number that doesn't have a representation of this form that doesn't have a representation um, with MA congruent to R modulo AD. And now, what, what can you say about those numbers? Well, uh, if you define the smallest positive integer that has a representation in R modulo AD, that's NRA, okay? So that is the smallest number positive, strictly positive, that has a representation as a non-negative linear combination of the A's equal to R modulo AD, 
then you can convince yourself. And I, 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 this just takes some sitting down and thinking a little bit. I don't expect you to follow every little state. At least I couldn't follow this. Then you see that the largest guy that does not have a representation is exactly the smallest positive that has a representation minus AD. So this, you have this formula here. And then the key point is that actually you can compute N of R A. And this is the formula that Brouwer and Shockley found. And so you've now lost somehow one dimension here, right, in this formula. So now N R A becomes the smallest uh, of the non-negative linear combinations because you've taken that mod A D here. Um, um, the, the, that satisfies this equation. Okay, very good. And so now, summing up, FA is equal to that, and then you plug this in and you get this answer. Now have a close look at how this looks like. It's the maximum of some minimum. Okay, that looks a lot like the diameter of the shortest distance. Think about it a little bit. What, what is the difference here? The difference is that we are only allowing non-negative coefficients and uh, only only uh, non-negative coefficients. In the in the diameter, we would also allow to go backwards and go this way. Here, we're only allowed to go right and up, if you like, in the in the lattice picture. So that actually looks a lot like the diameter for a directed graph, where you're only allowed to go in one direction, okay? And so the difference, oops, sorry, the difference between the directed, the undirected graph and the directed graph is that simply now you assign a direction for each edge. So here we would simply say in our example, we would simply say, uh, I'm only allowed to go from 1 to 3, from 3 to 5. So I'm really saying A minus J has to be congruent to A1 mod, uh, mod N. Okay, and before I had absolute values. And so this means I also have to put now directions here on my lattice graph. So I will have a directed lattice graph. And similarly for the blue guys, so now I'm I only allowed to go from one to four, et cetera, so I will have directions in this, uh, in this way. So now I'm only allowed to go right and up, okay? And so, but I still can ask for the diameter of these things, okay? And then, if you do this, there's a beautiful observation by Neuenhus, which is what I've just explained to you, that you can express the Frobenius number as the diameter of a directed circulant graph minus n. The minus n is because AD now plays the role of n, right? Here, yeah, where is my ND? Here. Yeah. So you see, this will now be the diameter, right? It's the minimum. That's like the, the distance. The, minimum, the distance is a minimum, the shortest path. And I'll take the biggest of those. That's the diameter. And so I get this formula. Aha, but there is a length. So I have actually weights now. Why do I have weights? Well, because these now in this geometric interpretation, these guys here uh, now play the role of a length, right? As I go through my path, I'm assigning a length here of these guys. And that length is exactly A2. And that length is exactly A1. So the lengths are not all one in this identification. Do you all see that? Yeah, right? Because you're forming these. If you, if you would just look at the standard graph distance where each edge has weight one, then you just had ones here everywhere. So this is different weight. And that's why the weights appear here. This is the length, and this is the labeling of the, of the edges. So they're both the same in this case. And so now there you see the Frobenius number is exactly the same 
as the diameter of a circulant graph with this particular choice of length. Okay? And so here you have the two limiting distributions. Um, and now on the left, you see the same distribution you've seen for the Frobenius numbers. But now, just to make things a little more beautiful here, as I haven't chosen the length that come from the Frobenius number. I've chosen, I've chosen length one, which is the more natural thing when you look at your directed graph. I've just given every edge length one. And you see it's exactly the same distribution as for the Frobenius numbers, because I told you earlier, the limit theorem that we had said that the limit distribution is independent of what length you choose on your graph. And that is a very non-trivial statement, and it's reflected in this thing here. Right, so that was the last lecture. And let me just recap what we've done in the last week. We've shown you what measure rigidity and homogeneous dynamics is good for in terms of proving sensational problems like the Oppenheim conjecture, quantum unique ergodicity, and some very nice observations on randomness and sequences like square root n mod 1. And then we've told you some of the basics that we have here. Um, everything in two dimensions, and the SL2R has a beautiful geometric interpretation in terms of hyperbolic geometry, SL2R acting via fractional linear transformations as isometries. Um, the main game played by SL2Z as the stabilizer of the lattice, the basic lattice, and so identifying the space of lattices with SL2R modulo SL2Z. We've told you um, how to prove equidistribution results that then later can be used um, uh, in, in the distributional problems, in number theory, etc., that we were interested in. Um, we didn't talk about how to prove the equidistribution of horocycles via Eisenstein series. Andreas talked about how to prove this doing representation theory and also how to derive it directly from the mixing property uh, using Margulis proof. Then we looked at the space of d-dimensional lattices, uh, how to understand when you go to infinity in a d-dimensional lattice using Mahler's criterion. Um, and then um, you remember maybe we then use these things to, to reprove some classical theorems a number theory on, say, the statistics of fair refractions, which have a natural generalization to higher dimensions, which people previously couldn't do without the space of lattices, because somehow, even though it's natural, it's never been done in this way. People were stuck in the, the one-dimensional problems. The three-gap theorem for n mod 1 interpreted as, as a, a, in terms of space of lattices. So there's a little handout on the web page, which you can download. That was a, one of the tutorial problems. And so the solution is on the web of this, this thing. And then we discussed other applications, statistics of directions and distribution of free path lengths in the Lorentz gas. The key tool, the Siegel-Veach formula. Yesterday, we talked about quasi-crystals and this morning. And that was the last lecture. So if you're interested, here's the reading list again. It's, I think, also somewhere on the web. And um, I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs>